here we are in Blender, uh, and this is the default view that you'll get when you first start Blender up. You can see here that we've got a main scene uh, with a cube appearing, and along the top we have what is called the info and menu bar. Uh, and basically there are typical menus like your saving menu up here, and also different viewports that you can actually see. This is the default view, and you can go to the, the full view, uh, example and there are different there are different views that we might use uh, during this course default view is the most common one that we use we also look at different scenes and that sort of thing and we can change our rendering course up here uh, over on the right hand side uh, this is actually referred to um, this section down here uh, from this point here down is called the properties panel and from this point up is called the outliner and you can see there for example the cube appears in there as does a camera, uh, the world, and there should also be a lamp there somewhere as well. And you can see these on the screen, the camera is this object here, the lamp is this object here. And I can select that lamp and you'll see that the properties down here do actually change and update. So going back to the cube, you'll see that the properties panel here changed and updated accordingly. Um, this whole section here, including this toolbar over on the left-hand side, is referred to as the 3D view. And down the bottom we have the timeline, uh, and the timeline is where we do uh, or manage our animation over time. Any of these views can be uh, expanded out, like so, uh, if you need to be able to see them. And I usually do expand this one out because it just makes it a little bit easier for me to see. The other thing you can do any time is to zoom in or out on any of these toolbars so that you can see more detail. So here we are looking at the 3D view in Blender and the first thing we're going to understand is how to manipulate that 3D view by moving parts around with the mouse. The first thing we're going to be able to do is to actually be able to rotate the view around in an orbit like fashion. I'm doing this on the trackpad by just using two fingers and lightly moving my mouse around. You can do this on a three button mouse by pressing and holding the scroll wheel. If you wanted to pan around, you can press and hold the shift while you use the same action on the mouse or on the trackpad. This gives you the ability to move around and, and uh, change the viewport without rotating. You might also want to zoom in and out, and this is by pinching or pressing or using the scroll wheel on the three button mouse. You can also change a number of views. So for example, down here in the side, uh, the view panel, there is the top view, the right view as an example, and there are two other types of views as well. First of all, the camera view shows you what it will look like uh, when it is rendered through the camera. If I now change just back to uh, a top view and scroll around a bit, I'm also going to demonstrate to you the difference between perspective and orthographic. At the moment I'm in perspective and in perspective as things get further away they get smaller. In orthographic as things get further away they stay the same size. Using perspective and orthographic have different purposes when you're doing things but for example when you're looking at the side view or a bottom view, it's often easier to look at it from an orthographic point of view where the things don't get smaller in the background in order to more correctly line things up with the center of another object or just lining them up with how you want them to actually orientate themselves on the plane. So here we are in Blender and we're going to basically start by deleting the default cube and I have to press function delete on my Mac. Uh, there is a different um, type of delete here that you can use um, but basically function delete works on mine. On a PC there's just the delete key as opposed to the backspace key. You notice that we've got this little uh, circle in the middle with the red and white on it. That is called the 3D cursor and when you add an object that is where the object will go or the center point of the object will go. First thing we're going to add is a mesh and basically or a plane and we're going to basically add that plane straight away I'm telling you now that we're going to scale this out so I'm just going to press the S key to scale and just scale it out so it's a bit bigger we'll go through that in more detail later the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to change my view here 
Uh, so I'm going to just go to a side view, so either the right or the back. And I'm going to click around about here just to change the location of my 3D cursor. You can see it's there at the moment. Uh, maybe I'll click over here and then click right back on there so it is exactly where I want it to be. There it is. So now I'm going to add another object. And this time I'm just going to add the monkey. And there the monkey is there. So if I go back to view and back to camera, I've now added the monkey. And the monkey is the default mesh. You can see I've clicked over there and moved the 3D cursor. But the monkey is the default mesh uh, for you to be able to test ideas and thoughts um, and just have a mesh that you can play around with. It's not just a standard everyday mesh. Just about every single type of software like this, like Blender, for example, there's one called Maya, and I believe they have a teapot. So you've got different meshes, uh, and this mesh is, has a name. You can see it up here. This mesh is actually called Suzanne uh, up here. So if I actually turn that off, you can see that Suzanne gets turned off and back on again. The next thing I'm going to add is my own file. And I'm going to go File, Import, to import my own 3D file. And I'm going to import an STL. And I believe on my desktop, I'm going to click there once, and I'm going to bring in my car 35 over here as an STL file. You'll notice that the uh, user interface for this is not like any other user interface in terms of file management. I think that's a bad choice that they've made in Blender, but that's what we have to go with. So now I'm going to import that STL, and the first thing you're going to notice is it's done something really weird to my screen, and that's because the STL is really, really huge. I'm zooming out here, zooming out as much as I can. There it is. Okay, that's how big it is, it's massive. So I'm just really quickly gonna scale that down until I can see all of that there and you can see that I've gotta zoom in a bit. And I've now got uh, an object on the screen. Bring it down to about the size so it's a little bit, pretty much the same sort of size as Suzanne is. And I'm just gonna quickly, while I've got that, grab that red point there and drag it out here and that's all we're going to do uh, for this part of the tutorial. So you can see that that's how you import or create objects uh, in Blender. Just going to change back to the camera view now so we can see what we've got. Zoom back in. So we can see that I've got a car on its side and I've got Suzanne in the middle of the screen. So picking up where we left off, we've basically now got to be able to move um, and rotate our objects as we need. Now basically this object is going to rotate around that point there. So one of the things I like to do with my objects is just really quickly once they've imported is to go up to the object menu and use transform. And I want to basically move the origin and the origin is what it will rotate around. Uh, around the center of mass. So now it's going to rotate a little bit more sensibly uh, in our opinion. If I actually have the right origin anywhere else it will rotate around that point and that point could be anywhere depending on how you imported your STL. In rotating around the center of mass is usually a good idea because you want your 3D object to behave like a normal object otherwise when you're an animating it it will rotate in strange ways. So basically, in order to rotate, we're going to press the R key, and that will bring us into a rotation. And if I just move my mouse there, I've got a very uncontrolled rotation. If I want controlled rotation, I want to rotate it around a specific axis. For example, at this point, I want my car to be on its wheels. Um, and the easiest way to do that from the point where it was is just to rotate it around the X axis. So while still in rotate mode, I'm going to press the X key. It will now only rotate around that location. So it's now uh, rotating. And if you look down in the bottom corner, it's very hard to sort of see, but it's down there in the bottom corner. It says rotating along global X. Now if I type in a number, like 90 for example, which makes a lot of sense, it's going to rotate 90 degrees, that will rotate it explicitly. So the shortcut key there is RX90, and then I press enter, and that change is accepted. The easy way to move this is to just grab this arrow here and move it and then let it go and that change will be accepted. But you can also use the G key for grab and then you can also use that shortcut notation of I want to move it only on the Y axis and now it will move freely on the Y axis. And I can also type in a number, let's just say I wanted it to move it uh, negative one unit 
from where it was and press enter to accept that change. Basically at the moment the car is not how I want it and neither is the monkey and this is the frame I'm going to be looking at. The first thing I'm going to basically do is to get that uh, that uh, floor thing and scale it again. Once again if I wanted to only scale it in the X direction I could press X to limit that. I'm going to press escape uh, for the moment so I'm going to press um, Actually, I'm just going to scale it out to about here, and I'm going to scale it in the Y direction about the same, so that it looks and it feels up more of the screen. And now I'm going to grab my monkey, so I'm going to right-click on my monkey, press G to grab. Now I can rotate it around as I still feel fit at this point, uh, but I'm going to limit that now to the Y axis and move it down here. And now the Z axis, sorry, the X axis, move it out here. I needed to press click to accept that. And then move it on the Y axis, so grab it on the Y, so GY. And then GX again, until I'm happy with the rough location of that monkey. I'm now going to do the same thing to similar sorts of things to my car. So I'm going to move it into the location, so grab uh, in the X axis, so move it a bit closer. Click it there. And now I'm going to rotate it last thing, so rotate around the Z axis. And I'm basically just going to use my mouse so I'm happy with the rotation that I've got and it can be a bit tricky to actually get that rotation how I want it but that's what I wanted I wanted to see that 35 in the side and there's the scene that I've got sort of got set up so basically using shortcut keys is really important in Blender so the first ones we've learnt are S for scale G for grab and R for rotate Now if I render this image, I'll basically get a good look at what it's going to look like. So let's zoom up here. So first of all, uh, we can see that the, the lighting is very harsh. Basically where there is light, you can see it, and where there is shadow, it's 100% dark. And that's never actually realistic. So the first thing we're going to do is go over to this properties panel over here, and look at the world symbol up here. And down in the world, we can turn it on some environmental lighting. And I'm going to set my environmental lighting pretty low at 0.1 to begin with. So let's actually render this image again and we'll see the difference that we have there. So now we have a more realistic, yet still very much grayscale image. So basically all of the things are the same color. Um, and we need, um, the only thing differentiating them is the way that the light falls on them. So basically we need to actually add some what we call materials to each of the objects to give them some more color um, and interest. Let's get into that. I'm going to change my view now back to the 3D view and make sure that my 3D mode is actually in material so we can see that what the material is roughly going to look like under the same light that we're currently working. So we've got our, our uh, material there. The first one we're going to do is basically we're going to make our car red. So we're going to go over to the materials button over here and create a new material for our car and we're just going to call this material car body okay so our car body material is now going to be and we'll change the color here to full on red so I'm just going to pull that down there and that's red you notice the specularity is a white color you can change that for example if you want it to look more like it's being affected by the sun you can change that to a yellow I like to leave it reasonably light with a, a slight hint of that color just gives a bit of a warmth in the feeling there now I'm going to right click on the monkey and the monkey I'm basically going to actually create a new one and I'm just going to call it M-O-N-K-E-Y for monkey uh, and basically I'm going to set that to green so green out here uh, we have a green monkey and now I'm going to right click on the floor surface now I'm going to go for a new surface and I'm going to go for somewhere in the blue. So we've got the red, we've got the green, we've got the blue. I might just lighten that off just a touch. There we go. And I'm basically going to call that material floor. It's always a good idea to label your materials because then you'll know what you've applied it to um, and you won't try and use that same color for something else. So that's basically the materials. Let's just render this now and see what happens. Um, and we've basically got um, some shapes that are pretty flat and you can see that specularity color is white on this one. Uh, so let's go and 
uh, click on the monkey and maybe make that specularity color a lighter green just to see if that actually uh, helps us. So we've got our specular color here. Um, let's just put that into the green. So the diffuse color, the specular color, and we can turn the intensity down as well. I seem to have actually accidentally turned on the ramp. That's what I've done there. So basically green on green will make that monkey look a bit better in my opinion. So let's render that image now. Yeah, that, that's, that's heaps better. So the monkey's basically staying that green color, yet the surfaces are still a different color. So basically the next thing we're gonna do is look at giving some of those surfaces a slight difference in their appearance. So let's look at our view and go back to 3D view and let's play with the floor. And we're gonna make it so that's a glossy blue floor. So to actually add gloss, we actually add a mirror uh, on here. So I'm gonna click on mirror and we increase our reflectivity. Once we've done that, if we go up to our, our view here, we'll see that we've got our reflectivity here, but we'll see that the reflectivity is quite white in color. So I'm once again gonna sort of make that a blue reflection so that it's sort of a bit deeper uh, and leave that specularity like it is in the white. Maybe make that slightly lighter. Okay, and now if I render it, you'll notice two things. First of all, there is actually a reflection in the surface of the uh, on which the car is sitting, so you can actually see some reflection, and it adds just a really nice touch and glossiness to that. But the other thing is, uh, our render time is now taking a fair bit longer. It's currently taking 10 seconds to do this render, so we need to be aware that that, that, that will affect uh, the way in which this works. The final thing we're gonna do is we're gonna look at this car and one of the advantages in, of importing an STL with different files or different STL objects embedded on each other. And we remember if we actually did this car that the car body and the car wheels are two separate um, entities within the system is that we can go into that and we can assign those different colors very easily. You can assign different colors to different points on the same object but it's more easy or it's easier uh, when you actually have different groups on there. So to do this, I'm gonna select the car and I'm gonna press the tab key. And the tab key has taken me into edit mode and I'm now looking at all the vertices that make up this car's shape. So basically I wanna press the A key to deselect them all. I'm gonna right click on one of the vertices over here on the wheel and in this, I can basically go select and I can choose linked or I can press control L and all of the linked vertices, all the vertices of that object will be selected. So I've selected one of the wheels. I'm now gonna go over to this button over here, which actually looks at my individual vertices and I'm gonna create a vertex group. The vertex group is going to be called front wheel and I'm going to then assign those vertices to that wheel. The only way I can tell that I've assigned them is to go deselect and select them again. So while that's highlighted, if I select it, I'll know that that's the case. I'm gonna lock that off now. I'm gonna create, a, um, I'm gonna deselect that. I'm gonna create a new vertice group. That group will be called back wheel. I'm now going to select the back wheel by right clicking on it and pressing Control L to select all of the linked vertices there. I'm now gonna assign them to this group and deselect and select again to make sure that that worked. I can also select this one now and select both of them by clicking and highlighting on there. Just to be certain of myself, I'm gonna de deselect both the front wheel and the back wheel and I'm gonna right click on here and I'm gonna press Control L and select those guys. I'm gonna create a new group and that group will be called car body. So now I have three groups. I'm gonna assign that group, make sure I can deselect and select that group. I'm gonna deselect that group now and just select the front wheel and the back wheel, or the back wheel and the front wheel is the way I did it. And now I'm gonna go into materials. So I now have this material here. This material is called car body. I'm gonna press this sign here and create a new material within the car. And I'm gonna basically call this material 
wheels. I'm going to set it to a fairly dark color, but not totally black. I discovered that totally black isn't great. Um, so basically, there it is there. Um, and it's going to be black in the sort of a blue haze tone. And press OK, you can see that there. Don't like the specularity being like that, so I'm going to turn the specularity down a fair way too. So you can just see it there. And now that those are selected, I'm going to press Assign. And you should see that they've gone black, but if I move across to this section here and press the A key, you can see that they are definitely now black. So that's how I've basically assigned different parts of the same object to um, different colors. I need to now get out of edit mode. You can see I'm in edit mode. I can go back to object mode, and I can change back into edit mode while I'm selected for that, and it will go back in there. So now back out to object mode. Here we are. I've got the wheels and my car looking different. I'm now going to press the render image just to see how long that takes and to see what that looks like. And I'm pretty happy with that. So I've now got black wheels uh, on a red car with a green monkey in the background and a nice reflective surface. I'm now going to basically add a texture and a texture is simply changing the material of the object to be that of an image. So I'm going to go straight into this. I'm actually going to change the texture of the floor to give it a nice wood grain look. So I'm going to basically go in now. I've got that selected. You can see that that's selected on the, on the bounty box on it. I'm now going to press on the texture material and I'm going to add a new texture. The new texture is going to be an image. So I'll leave that as is and I'm going to click on open and I'm going to choose images and I've got a whole file in my uh, folder in my documents called textures and I've got a whole bunch of ones that I've used here it's hard to see them in this view but I'm just going to go for wood floor as my texture and click on open image you can see now that the texture or the, the, the material has changed color to match the rough color of the texture but you still can't see that texture in the uh, the view the materials view you should be able to see it so if you actually just go texture view you should see the texture color but in the material you should see the grain of the wood in that so in order to do that we're going to edit mode so we're going to press tab to go into edit mode we're going to press u for uv unwrap and i'm going to click on smart uv unwrap and click on ok you can now see that we have that wood grain texture in there even better when you render it because it actually had that glossy sort of feel to it, it's now going to be a very glossy tabletop feel to it. Um, so the wood is nice and warm in colour. The grain is in there, but it's still got the reflective surface. So it's actually looking like a polished piece of timber. It's finally time to take uh, or create a very simple animation and a lot of the work we'll be doing now will be down in the timeline uh, down here. So basically we're going to be animating the camera and the way to do that is to just select it on the outside uh, so that over here uh, it is selected. So we're actually in edit mode at the moment. We'll come out of edit mode and we're going to click on uh, this one here. So we're going to basically change our our uh, animations here to location, rotation and scale so that we're going to be able to move it. We're going to wait 20 frames so animation is going to sit still for a while. This is always good so it means you can edit it a little bit more easily. Uh, so we're going to put a keyframe there so that will put a little yellow marker there. You can see the little yellow marker to indicate that there is a keyframe on the camera. We're going to shorten our uh, video to 180 frames so I'm basically going to end it at 180, so I'm going to type that in down here. At the 160th frame is where I'm going to end my animation to give me 20 frames of nothing at the end. So basically I'm going to use this tool over here, there's a little panel here, a hidden one. Uh, and we're going to lock the camera to the view. Oh no, I'll just drag that back in so that it goes away. So now what I when I move the camera will also move. So it's locked here at this position. So I'm going to bring it around to here and maybe zoom in a bit to there. Use the pan tool and just bring it down to a bit more of an angle like that. Zoom it in until I'm happy with the frame that I've got to end off on. Now, 
basically just going to really quickly do a render of that particular image just to make sure, whoops, stop. Let's just go back to this view here. Um, I've lost it there. So I should have actually saved that keyframe first. So basically going to move around here until I've got the car. We've still got the 35 in there. Just move it so that I'm really happy with it. Then I'm going to lock that keyframe off. So press this button here. You should see that little yellow one there. Now I need to render that frame. And you'll see that that image is quite good. It's a lot of the front of the car, so there's a lot of red in there. So ordinarily, I'd want some more features or details on the front of my car. Um, but that's pretty good. And the monkey's a bit greeny, but that's all right. Um, this is just a test animation to see how it works. So now I should be able to go back to my view here. And also check that make sure that the framing of each frame as it goes through uh, looks good. So this is the basic animation there. Comes in like that. And I'm pretty happy with that overall animation. Maybe I should change it about there so that the bottom of the car doesn't go off the frame. Uh, let's do that. So let's add in an extra bit there. So here where the bottom of the car is off the frame, I'm going to rotate my camera down just a bit further so that we've got this extra keyframe here and put that keyframe in there. So now if I press play, the car stays nicely in the view the whole time. And that sort of animation and sequencing and framing of the video the whole way is really important to getting a really nice uh, looking animation. So basically that's what we need to do. The final thing we need to do is to render it. So we need to render the whole animation and to do that properly we need to go up to this scene video here and we need to choose a few options down here. For starters, I want to output it to a different location. It's currently going to this thing called temp. So I'm going to go to documents. I've got a year 9 folder. I've got a 3D digital design folder. Let's just save it in there. So I'm going to hit accept. Now basically I'm going to change the, the file type. For me, I'm going to change it to QuickTime. Uh, QuickTime is the one I want to use. Uh, and basically leave everything else like that. If I don't change it from that to QuickTime, if I leave it on PNG, which is what it was, I will get 180 pictures that I'll then have to stitch together. At this case, I get a QuickTime movie. So now I'm going to press render, and each frame, so as I render, each frame is taking about 10 seconds. So that's 180 times 10 seconds, which is about half an hour to render this particular animation. So if I leave that going, it will take half an hour. I'm going to stop that render. Uh, because it's just going to um, uh, it's just going to basically uh, take up too much time of this video, uh, and then I'll show you the end result once we're done.